Today on TAG, we'll be talking about guns with Stephen Gutowski, editor, writer, publisher of The Reload, the number one source for gun news, gun information. We'll be talking about the NRA. We'll be talking about reporting, what's good, what's bad, what's underreported. We'll be doing trivia and more. Talking with Stephen Gutowski today on TAG. Thank you for joining us today on TAG. We'll be talking about guns with Stephen Gutowski. Stephen has his own website, podcast, newsletter, right? All of that, Stephen? That's right. My, uh, my own publication called The Reload. The Reload, and uh, I subscribe. Anybody can subscribe to it. You can do it for a year. You can do it monthly. I just want to make sure that everybody knows. Because when it comes to gun issues, Stephen, I find that your website, your newsletter, is the number one source of all guns around news. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We do our best to you know, bring a sober, serious approach to to reporting and, and analysis, uh, specifically on firearms. So, so I'm I'm glad to hear you say that. I, you know, we've had a lot of support, and and we've had a lot of people from uh, all over the gun debate, uh, each side uh, subscribe, and including leadership from multiple different gun groups on on either side. So it's interesting, Stephen, because you were at the Washington Free Beacon. I think you've written for a bunch of other publications as well, right? The Atlantic, maybe. Yep. Also. And then you decided to focus entirely on gun ownership and policy. That is not an easy uh, thing to do, to go on your own and do this. You're really taking a big risk. Uh, why did you take this big leap? And then if you could tell us why, why the gun issue, why this specific issue is so important to you. Sure. Well, I had spent uh, almost seven years at the Free Beacon building out this beat on uh, gun politics and policy because the Free Beacon likes for their reporters to focus on a specific topic and, and really learn and master that topic. And so I learned a lot while I was working there uh, and had a lot of success with that approach. And I noticed that in the, the market generally, this is something that needed to be filled. This is a niche that needed to be filled that wasn't really getting the kind of dedicated attention that I think it deserves from most media outlets, you know, whether they're uh, the more traditional larger outlets like the Post or the Times or the Wall Street Journal or, or even, you know, conservative outlets or even gun specific outlets, which focus more on, uh, you know, the latest guns that come out and reviews and, and uh, you know, opinion pieces, things like that. And so there wasn't really something specifically focused on gun reporting, especially from a more, um, uh, you know, reasonable standpoint of that focuses on facts and uh, analysis rather than, you know, heated opinions. So to show how important your analysis, your writing is, and the what you've created for yourself, what you've carved out, you've become an expert for other people on the gun issue as sort of a neutral source, right? So maybe tell us a couple of times where you've been contacted by other media to come on or other people because you are seen as a neutral arbiter. Yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I don't hide my background or my experience as a firearm safety instructor or a gun owner, but I do my best to uh, present each side in a fair manner in the way that they would you know, put themselves forward to other people and to, you know, explain the issue as best as I can uh, without um, relying on, on cliches or tropes or, or, or anything like that. And so as a result of this, over the years, I've had a lot of other reporters from every major outlet, really, the Post, the CNN, MSNBC, uh, you know, CBS News, uh, reach out for assistance on stories just to try and, because oftentimes in, in my experience, uh, most reporters, most of your people who are doing the actual, you know, writing of news reports, not necessarily the the talking head types, the opinion people, but the ones actually writing up stories, they want to be accurate and right. they, they want to get the story right. Uh, they often just don't have the experience or the knowledge when it comes to firearms to do that. So as a good reporter should, oftentimes they'll reach out. Uh, and ask me for advice, and I give advice off the record on uh, to how someone can, you know, who can you reach out to for a good source for this story that's going to represent uh, the, a viewpoint properly, and and uh, and also, you know, where where can you find the sorts of statistics that are required from, you know, whether it's from the ATF or DOJ or or uh, the gun industry or, or whoever. Um, 
and and a lot of people take advantage of that and I, and I think that's wonderful and obviously i also do regular interviews on right. places like entertainment tonight uh recently for the alec baldwin situation and uh you know fox news cnbc um uh you know uh, c-spans washington journal i've done i've done all kinds of you know your traditional style interviews as well but i think helping reporters find that information for their own stories and just giving them being a resource for them is an important part of what I'm trying to do. Right. And then you talk about the fact that what, one of the things that you do is you try to talk about the underreported aspects of gun ownership, which you may be talking about when you talk to reporters. What's an example of something that's underreported that should be more reported uh, in, jur in, in journalism now? Oh, yeah, certainly. I mean, what I think we tend to focus a lot in both media and in the political debate over guns on really the same couple of issues uh, for the last 30 years, uh, despite the fact that those opinions on those issues have become extremely entrenched. So things like uh, universal background checks or assault weapons bans, uh, stuff like that gets a lot of attention, yeah. but there really isn't ever any movement on it uh, over the past, since the 90s, right? Since the assault weapons ban expired in 2004. But uh, at the same time, there's a lot of things changing in the gun world that don't get much attention, especially on the cultural side, on the who owns guns, right? You're moving from more of your traditional stereotypical gun owners, who's, you know, a white guy, white male from a more rural area who likes to own guns for hunting purposes to somebody who's more uh, it tends to be more women now, more minorities, people who live in more suburban and urban areas, and they tend to want to buy guns for self-defense or sporting use. And that's been a huge shift in the industry. It's changed a lot about how the industry operates, and uh, it's created a whole new group of gun owners that don't fall into these sort of stereotypical uh, boxes that I think most people in media or even just Americans generally would, would put people in who own guns. And I think totally that's a agree. fascinating development. Can I give you an example? Let me give you yeah. an example, Stephen. We just did this study with Beacon Research in Boston on gun owners, and they found that uh, the numbers of people who are buying guns for protection has reversed from the 1990s when it was most people bought guns, they would say, for hunting in the 90s. And now, and a couple of other studies are showing this as well, more people are buying guns for protection, and those numbers have completely turned around, like 55, 25, um, in the last few years. You also see this in the kind of guns people buy. It used to be that long guns sold more, so shotguns and rifles, which are used more often for hunting purposes, uh, although obviously can be used for self-defense as well, or home defense, uh, usually. But uh, now people mostly buy handguns, and that's really accelerated even over the last couple of years. And you can see this in the the background check data from the FBI, from uh, the Nationalistic Criminal Background Check System. And so the, these trends are are it's not just uh, you know the National Shooting Sports Foundation, right? The the Gun Industries Trade Group that's saying this. They are they are saying, right. and they have their own data to back it up. But you also see this in in other data from the FBI and from even from your guys' research. That's right. It's very interesting how things have changed. Now, obviously, something else that's changed that's a big development is what's going on with the NRA, right? So in the last few years, the NRA has been having some huge issues. They've been the most prominent voice on gun issues for many years, um, and now probably less so, given all the stuff that's going on there. Do you see What do you see as the future of the NRA? Do you see what's happening there affecting gun policy generally, or how do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, certainly what happens to the NRA is going to be a big deal when it comes to gun policy because the NRA has long been and still remains today the largest gun group of, and I'm talking about on either side of the issue, uh, in the country. Uh, you know, it's a $400 million organization and it's got 5 million dues paying members, um, which is way more than anyone else out there on either side. And so, obviously what happens with that and they have a national network of uh lobbying efforts across the country in every state and on capitol hill you know so th there's a huge uh uh impact a huge footprint that the nra has and so with this lawsuit uh over these corruption allegations against leadership against people like wayne lapierre you know the outcome of that 
is going to be hugely impactful on on the gun debate on on anything having to do with guns because the NRA is so influential. And obviously, the Attorney General there, Letitia James, uh, is seeking to dissolve the group completely. I yeah. don't know if she'll actually get yeah. that goal. That's a big, yeah. big ass. It's very yeah. controversial. But but um, you know, it's hard to look at the situation and think they're going to get out of it unscathed either. Right. So, but whatever happens is going to be extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so too. But I think what people are going to find is it's not just the NRA. You know, people disagree on the issue regardless of where the NRA stands. There is not, you know, how you feel about it in New York is not necessarily the same way as people feel about it in Tennessee. And I don't think that people really understand that yet because they yeah. think that the NRA has this all encompassing power when really it's the people that power the NRA. Right. Yeah. And you can look at, uh, I wrote a whole piece on this in the Atlantic, not a long time ago here, but <clears throat> the NRA has obviously been in a uh, controversial situation for the last two years or so. Uh, and Democrats have had complete control of the Congress and the presidency since, you know, 2020. And at the same time, you're still not seeing the kind of huge change in gun policy that you might imagine if, if all that mattered for uh, gun policy was was the NRA, right? Because there's a lot of Democrats on the Hill and in the Senate, you know, people like Joe Manchin or even uh, Pat Toomey who are not uh, beholden to the NRA by any means, by any objective Absolutely. look right. at it. Right. But at the same time, they, they're they not necessarily going to be in lockstep with what the most uh, aggressive gun control groups want to do either because it's not just the NRA. It's not just the lobbying and it's not just the c campaign spending that matters in this conversation. It's also what these people, these senators uh, and other representatives, what their constituents want. And they, there's 5 million dues paying members of the NRA, right? And we talked about why that's such a big number. It's not, there aren't really a lot of groups out there that have something like that where people pay you to be part of the organization, right? Um, but there's like 110, 120 million Americans who report having a gun in their home. Uh, and if you go down to the lesser, uh, you know, if it's just people who report owning a gun personally, that's still in the, you know, 90 million or so range. And that's, those are huge numbers that go well beyond what the NRA has, even though the NRA is the largest group. So, you know, yeah, you can see how it's, it's not just the NRA. They're powerful, but it's not just that. Right. And more money in the last couple of elections has gone into the gun reform side. Right. Yeah. In the every, town, every town outspent the NRA in 2018. Um, the NRA actually managed to outspend uh, every town in 2020, although they lost. The, you know, their guy lost. Trump right. lost. So, you know, it's not just about money either. Right. right? I agree 100 um, percent. You know, we did this speaker research survey over a thousand gun owners. And one thing that was interesting was a majority of gun owners support background checks, less, but many support red flag laws, but they don't think that their peers support those issues. Do you have a sense of why that would be, why there would be this disconnect between what they believe and what they believe their peers are thinking? Yeah, I mean, that's that's an interesting question, right? Uh, I think that one explanation could be that most of the gun, uh, gun rights groups don't support these policies, uh, at least not as their generally tend to be written. Um, so, so, you know, that a lot of people will take their cues from for what gun owners believe from what the groups that represent them to believe, right, uh, in politics. So that's probably part of it. Obviously, you know, it's, it's one poll, so you can't necessarily completely, uh, you know, draw a, a final conclusion from it. But uh, I think I believe there's been some other polls that show similar things yeah. as well. Um, and then, you know, you also have to think about, too, what people are imagining when they say they support something like universal background checks right. or red flag laws versus what happens at, you know, uh, the ballot box when those policies aren't passed in Republican right. states or even when even in situations where they're put to a vote directly to voters like in Maine in 2016, they voted yes. on a universal background check bill, but it, it failed. Um, even though the uh, uh, proponents for it outspent the the opponents of it, 
uh, because when you there's there because, I think there's a general idea that people do like background checks uh, on firearm sales, uh, and people like the idea of somebody who is presenting themselves to be a threat to themselves or others. Uh, that they should there should be a mechanism to uh, either take away their guns, but also you know de deal with help them get mental health resources and. Uh, you know, go beyond just uh, the, the simple red flag laws. But at the same time, when you get down to some of the details of these things, like um, where do you draw the line as, as far as what requires a background check? Um, if I want to, uh, if my friend needs to borrow a gun to protect themselves, you know, this this actually happened to me personally during the, the riots last year. There were a family friend wanted to borrow a gun um, because of that the concern over those. And under, for instance, uh, HR8 in the House, uh, the, the bill that the House passed last year, uh, which was a universal background check bill, that puts a background check on all transfers, not just sales. And in that situation, right. I, you, what I lending them that gun would have been illegal without first right. going to a gun store and doing a background. Right. So there's, you know, it, it's there's there's a number of things to consider. Is is all I would say on that. It's it's not. Uh, I think people like the general idea. And then sometimes when you get down to the specific details of each proposal, there are things in there that that they don't like as much. Um, but but yeah, as far as the disconnect, they probably look at they look to groups like the NRA or uh, any number of other gun rights groups to to uh, for a sign of how other gun owners feel about something, even if they don't agree. Uh, Stephen, I, I agree with you. Also, you know, you talking about Maine, and Maine has a very different red flag law, for example. Mm -hmm. than California has, right? right. It's a totally different law. <clears throat> Every state is different. People feel differently. I'm going to ask you um, some sort of rapid questions now, Stephen, that will take a short period of time. <clears throat> um, one is, there's a person named Nick Saiti, I think is how you say his name, who owns the record for world's fastest reload. Note that the reload is the name of your website publication. <laughs> so, Here's a question for you. It's kind of amazing. How quickly did Nick reload a magazine into his pistol that set the world's record? Oh, man. I've seen some of these competition guys. And boy, uh, I, I'm sure it's it's got to be like 0.3 seconds. Something. You're like close. That. It's 0. Yeah. 0.51. Yeah. That's pretty that, good. That's amazing, too. That's amazing. Uh, um, uh, these are some interesting facts. Okay, so there's a uh, The Matrix Reloaded. Hmm. When did that come out? What year did that come out? Oh man, that was the that's the second one. It is, right. and your website has nothing to do with Keanu Reeves, correct? <laughs> Although I'd love to have him on my podcast. <laughs> That'd be fun. Um, when did that one come out? Take a guess. That must have been two thousand three. You are correct. Hey, I feel like I'm going to see the new one too. There's a new one coming out real soon. Yes, so yes, we're going to see that one. All right, so here's another one that I just found out. Can you guess which city has a law, which they enacted in 1982, which requires every family to own a gun? Oh, I know this one. That's uh, that's in Georgia, Kennesaw. Right. Very yeah. good. Uh, here's another good one. But very, very relevant politically, yeah. It's very, that's very good. Over the past 50 years, gun owners have contributed how much to wildlife conservation mm -hmm. due to attacks on the sale of guns and ammo? There's no way you could know this, but... It's got to be in the. Well, are you talking not dollar amount? Or Dollars. Percentage. I'm going to oh. give you a dollar amount. Oh gosh, uh, a lot. Hundred million. Two billion. Two. Wow. Yeah, I was way off. I knew. I know it's like in the ninety percentage. That's pretty amazing. Like it's uh, in the ninety percentile. Yeah, that's mainly how we fund our conservation. Yeah. It's amazing. Make sure to check our Instagram feed at ninety seven percent org if you want to see more of these interesting facts. Stephen, one thing we do at the end of uh, all of our interviews, and thank you so much for doing this because I know you're busy, um, is we ask a person to tag somebody else that we should have on and chat with. Who would you like us to talk to? Uh, I think Rob Pincus, who's a, a gun rights activist and a, a gun safety instructor, would be a good guy for this. I think he'd be open to doing it. Um, he likes to go out and talk to whoever whoever will listen, right? Okay. So I think, uh, I think that'd be a good conversation. All right. Well, I hope uh, people subscribe to your website, your newsletter, which is super informative. I can absolutely see why all of these reporters call you for information. I mean, you are a one-stop shop. So it's the reload. 
and people should sign up and pay for it. They should really, they've got to pay for it, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, we've got a podcast with uh, Ryan Ducey, who's a former gun salesman turned gun control activist coming up. Uh, so I, think I know I just who are watching it. this might be interested right. in that. So I know who that is. Yeah. Um, thank you, Stephen, so much for joining us. And thank you for joining us today for TAG. Absolutely.